Early rising to everybody. Good morning and welcome to our webinar this morning, looking at these interesting events that we've had the last couple of weeks and how they unfolded. And so, you know, putting something like this together, I just want to first say thank you so much to Marsh for stepping up, <laughs> stepping up. You see the, the IMSA vision for next year, stepping up, helping us, helping us put this together and making it possible. So thank you to Marsh. And then of course, all the support and always the support from Jeremy Maggs, ready on the drop of a hat to facilitate sessions, you know, magnitude <laughs> importance to the risk profession. So uh, Jeremy, thank you so much. And so by way of introduction, let me just set the scene. Let me create the reason why we wanted to set the session up and set it up so urgently. I reflect back on a letter we wrote to the pres presidency, April 2020. And we wrote to the president and you'll see it on the screen. And the importance of that was already then we reflected two things. One, that COVID was no longer a risk. It, wa it was a risk that is materializing. And two, that this risk has now and will cause many other risks. And so you'll see, uh, we've highlighted in red, what we wrote to the president in April 2020 already. And so the value of this webinar, thanks to the facilitation of Jeremy, the panel that we've put together, which he will introduce to you, we are looking to achieve an understanding, insights, sharing by the panel of their experiences, their thought leadership, their areas of expertise on what we need to know looking at the interpretation that they have of it and how we need to pull that in into our risk management process, understanding the stakeholders involved, understanding their objectives, and of course, using that information as part of our external and internal environmental analysis and understanding the context in which we need to then give information through to our leadership so that they can make excellent decisions. And without further ado, I want to say welcome to all 350 plus of our participants this morning. I want to ask that you raise your opinions, engage in conversation in our uh, chat box. And if you have any questions to Jeremy and the panel, please raise those in the Q&A. And with that, I'm going to hand over to Jeremy. And thanks again to Marsh for making this possible on such short notice. Jeremy, good morning. And good morning to the panel and over to you. Thank you. Chris, thank you very much indeed. And uh, a very warm welcome to all the participants. And your way of introduction, I think, is spot on and right on point. I don't think since the advent of democracy that we've seen violence sweep across the country, such as we witnessed over the past 10 days or so. And let me start off by saying, and I know I speak on behalf of the Institute and uh, all the participants today, that our thoughts and prayers are with every single person uh, who has been affected in one way or another. I think it's fair to say that there is some debate about exactly uh, what it was that caused this. And if you look at reports last night, there even seems to be confusion within government ranks about the definition of insurgency. We don't need to go there. Uh, this is a perfect metaphor, though, I think, uh, for, for what happened. There was an enormous amount of confusion in the air, and it's raised, once again, the country's risk profile and I think is forcing both the public and the private sector to relook at risk strategies in this regard. And we will get to that later on in this webinar. So I hope over the next uh, 50 minutes or so, we can give you some sense of what happened. We'll do our best, um, but perhaps more importantly, what plans going forward need to be put in place. So um, I endorse um, Christopher Palm's words on behalf of the Institute of Risk Management. A very warm welcome to this uh, special webinar, uh, Civil Unrest and South Africa's Future. The panel members, Dr. Morne Mostert, Director of the Institute for Futures Research at Stellenbosch University. Morne, always good to see you. Thank you very much indeed. There you see Mandy Wiener, who I've known for donkey's years, author, journalist, commentator, broadcaster, 
and a good friend of mine. I also want to introduce you to Ronak Gopaldas, political economist, describes himself as a pracademic. I have no idea what that means. Perhaps he'll tell us. He's also a writer and a speaker. And then uh, someone who I have also known for a long time, Dr. Pari Lehotla, former statistician general, without his yellow suit today, he became famous for that. Uh, yeah, executive committee you. member of the Indlula Niti South African Scenarios 2030 Trust. To all of you, a very warm welcome. Uh, Morne, simply because you're at the top of my list, I'm going to go to you first of all. And I'm going to put this question to all of you as widely as I can. And maybe give us your sense of what happened and what was behind it. <laughs> Jeremy, good morning. It's always great to, to have you as our facilitator. And uh, good morning to Christopher Ermson, our, our panelists and guests. Um, <clears throat> well, we, we know that uh, from a complexity science perspective, and, and this is one lens that we can have on this situation, Jeremy, is that it is indeed complex. And one of the fundamental principles in understanding complex systems is the idea that it is never caused by one thing. In other words, the, the hunt for a singular cause would actually lead to a misunderstanding rather than a deeper understanding. So I think there are some um, some obvious suspects, and of course, um, we can speculate, social conditions being the, the most prevalent of those. The, the Institute, for example, and, and many of us have, have spoken about this idea that uh, the youth of South Africa are, are really um, ready for, um, a, for an opportunity like this. When you are not in education, you're not in employment, you're not in training, and you have no prospects, then you're really the ideal candidate to join an insurrection. And then secondly, when you have a group, some of them inside, I suspect the ANC, some of them on the borders, whose greatest fear is the rule of law itself then you will be willing to do almost whatever it takes to make sure that the rule of law does not take its course. And of course, many of us believe that that's exactly what Jacob Zuma did for, uh, for many decades. I would then just uh, finally, Jeremy, say that the idea of a complex system, which this is, was exploited by the instigators. And if you wanted to cause an insurrection, you would find, one, a highly unstable country, two, a ruling party at war with itself, three, a growing number of fringe figures, and then the four, as I've indicated, the youth, and this is not my idea, this is Marx's idea, who are not engaged, not connected anywhere in society. And what you would then do is you would simply take very small actions. We now know that that's exactly what happened. People would drive up in a million rand plus veto and break one window. And in fact, that is all it would take to set off the powder keg. So multiple causes, some obvious suspects, but certainly a system almost waiting for an insurrection. So, Dr. Lahotla, let's uh, ex let's push that a little further, if we can. Uh, Dr. Mostert is suggesting that the circumstances coalesced, that the conditions were absolutely right for something like this to happen. What was your sense of it then? Well, no, thank you very much, uh, Jeremy. Uh, thank you very much, uh, listeners. Uh, it's a very somber period, uh, a Mandela month. Uh, it's like uh, going to a wedding uh, with squabbling uh, parties uh, from the groom to the bride uh, families. Uh, this is what has been in the ANC for the last 12 years. Each time they said they want to go for a, a what would be reflection, deep reflection, introspection, all the words have been abused of that means something. Those words around wisdom and doing things right and, and knowing from the past have been abused in the last 12 years. And this precipitated, in many ways, removing their eyes from the policy ball that they have to be watching. 
but focusing on their internal fight. And when, two, when elephants fight, the grass gets hurt. And that's what we have seen uh, in this. It's a complex system and complexity cannot be simplified. The law of cybernetics says complexity needs complex processes to resolve it. Simplicity is not what will resolve it. And a good story to tell is not what will uh, do it. We have in our midst young people whose futures are continuously materially being taken away by their parents. If you look at the labor force information uh, that uh, uh, the, the situation is getting uh, worse. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, nine, 2008, the, the, the proportion and the absolute number of youth that were employed were higher in absolute terms than the youth that is employed today in absolute terms. And their share is being taken by the elder, those who are 35 and above. So any youth that looks at that pyramid of benefits realizes that there's no future for them. And government has not focused its eye on that dilemma. They, and in complex systems, you need science. You, you cannot run it uh, uh, politically. I, I mean, we haven't defined what is the socially desirable outcome. How, what is the politically mobilizing philosophy to take us towards that uh, socially desirable position? And we don't have an economic policy that does that. So if you were to have a Venn diagram, imagine it uh, with three uh, circles, those circles are sitting far apart and they cannot be brought together. Now, poverty and the poor at times Times are blamed for in rising and uh, articulating and uh, their own agency. Poverty usually is a host for all forms of parasites. Top on those this time around in this are uh, politicians and bad politics. Those are the parasites that have hibernated in this fear of poverty and they've created a very vulgar uh, system instead of resolving this. So this is the position in which we are. So call it whatever you want to call it. Um, Mr. Mandela said that they, 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 these people want money fast, but uh, there are people in politics who actually got money billions fast. And the poor who are trying to get a bag of uh, millies and, and the like are said to be, I mean, uh, so uh, uh, Mr. Zuma, uh, the former president has been given a lease, a long lease of life by parliament, by his colleagues in parliament, protecting him all the way. And when they are afraid of being eaten up themselves, that's only when they took action against him. It cannot be that that action was principled. It was notoriously corrupt. And right. we have, that's what we have been dealing with over this period of time, unfortunately, happening in- right. Doctor, Doctor the hotline, I'm, go I'm, go I'm, going, to, I'm going to stop you there because I do want to move on to the other panels, but you've raised two very important issues, which I want to try and get back to if we can a bit later. One is the eye of the policy ball. And the other issue that we'll get to is what ultimately is the socially desirable outcome. Mandy Wiener, to you, if you've listened to both uh, Dr. Morstadt and uh, Dr. Lehotla, uh, both um, in their opening remarks have spoken about the disaffected youth, the angry youth young people in South Africa, rampant unemployment. While the situation is highly complex, that to me seems to be a common thread. Certainly, and I think that I agree with this notion, Jeremy, that uh, it was a perfect storm and that uh, there was a climate that was rife to be ignited. But I think it's also important to look at the catalyst of what's ignited this uh, this uprising. And the fact that we know that there is huge unemployment, we know that there's disenfranchisement, there are underlying socioeconomic issues, but I think it's also important to look at, at what lit the spark. And you and I both work in the field of, of facts. And, and if you look at what we actually know at this point about that, it's not much. We know that the president is calling it an insurrection. The Minister of Defense, Nosibibu Mapisan Kakula, is not calling it an insurrection. There's a disconnect there. Uh, but I think that there, there was a coming together of, of various things that lit the spark. And I think that 
ostensibly we've been told that it is the Free Jacob Zuma campaign and that there, there may have been um, a parallel security structure of spies or MK operatives that started this whole thing. And I think that's what we need to be looking at as well is who was behind this? Who are these 12 people that that government is after? We don't know the identities. There's been no transparency around that. We don't know if they're still operational. We don't know how long this was in the making. And I think that a few different things uh, are behind this. So I think that they clearly it took a long time to plan, firstly, and there, there was clear, there were clearly drivers of this who had orchestrated it, who knew that there was this disenfranchised youth and that there was this climate that was ripe to, uh, to be instigated. Um, but I think that also a few other things happened. Over the state capture era, we look at the uh, complete evisceration of law enforcement, of our intelligence structures, which I know we will talk about as well, but that can't be underestimated. The fact that we were so ill-prepared and that we did not have the intelligence and mm -hmm. that we were completely caught with our pants down is, is something that we really need to look at. So for me, it, it, it's, it's a perfect storm, but I think there are two elements that we need to, to unpack. It's, it's, it is the poverty, the disenfranchisement, uh, all of that. But at the same time, I think that we, we really need to unpack the issue of, of who was behind this. This is an insurrection, regardless of what the defense minister calls it. And I think that that is being downplayed to an extent. I think it's extremely concerning. And the way that government failed us, how they were glacially slow, the police to respond, how we still don't know a lot of the details that we should know at this point as the South African public and how we're feeling about that because we don't feel protected. We do feel let down and we do feel that we're on our own here. So, Ronak Gopaldas, let me come to you now, and again, leading on from what Mandy Wiener said, and I'm also going to take one of the comments from our participants, is that how on earth uh, could the risk not have been anticipated and planned for? Uh, all of you, to a greater or lesser extent so far, have referenced the failure in terms of intelligence gathering. How did that happen, I wonder? Thanks, Jeremy. Um, so I think the framing of this issue has been has been quite curious. And in South Africa, you know, we're obsessed with heroes and villains, winners and losers, good guys and bad guys. And, you know, that's quite simplistic and reductionist. And I don't, don't think it, it explains the situation properly or does it justice. I think what's quite evident, as some of the other panelists have said, is that the ANC factionalism is now out in the open and has spilled over with very serious ramifications, uh, with the NPA starting to grow some teeth uh, and the Zuma arrest that had the RET crowd running scared. And this, in my mind, was a very deliberate effort to undermine Ramaphosa. Um, in my mind, I think there's, there was quite a clear attempt to bait Ramaphosa into a heavy-handed approach um, and, and reduce his legitimacy ahead of the ANC 2022 conference. So that's the first part. I think the second one is whether this was spontaneous or choreographed. And that's a question that I'm getting from a lot of my clients. And again, as Mandy said, it was both. You had this political catalyst with ethnic dimensions. And once that momentum was established, uh, you had elements like criminality, opportunism, and desperation coming to the fore. And that's, that's pretty obvious because you had inequality and poverty. You had these harsh lockdown conditions, food prices going, going up, lack of credibility in the state, and very dim economic prospects, which I think point to, more broadly speaking, a very damaged social contract. Um, you know, if you're someone who was participating in the looting, you know, you could very legitimately turn, turn around and say, well, the health minister who was tasked with protecting us in the eye of the storm was, was being corrupt. So, you know, there is an overwhelming sentiment that the system, the entire system has failed people. Um, I think what the president is really trying to do is repair the social contract. And we know that the social contracts are either repaired, rejected, or rewritten. And, you know, to do that, I think he's recognized that the starting point is capacitating institutions with credibility and legitimacy, but the dividends pay up in the, in the longer term. Um, I think right now, uh, the president is facing multiple crises, crises of credibility, confidence, and competitiveness in the economy, and navigating an economy that's dealing with debt, disease, and dysfunction, all without the very clear backing or unified backing of his party. So, you know, all of these factors, I think, point to the broad, broader issue of the social contract, which needs to be repaired in South Africa. 
Dr. Morne Mostert, let me come back to you, the social contract. Um, many would suggest that um, it's beyond repair, that we are in a space now where we are, it's uncharted territory, that this could be uh, the start of uh, another insurrection, or at least something akin to that. So my question to you is, pick up on the point that uh, Ronak was making about um, whether we can repair the social contract, but I still want to come back to the issue of why the risk was not anticipated and planned for. Because as Christopher Palm shared in uh, the letter that the Institute wrote to government a year ago, all of this was outlined. Uh, it was it was obvious to all of us. It's um, it, it was certainly obvious that it was possible. Um, and the probability uh, to use our language was, was rapidly increasing. Um, <clears throat> One of the things we're interested in um, as, as futurists, Jeremy, uh, one of the questions we ask about societies is to what degree is that society future oriented? Now, I'll tell you when we've engaged with many groups in, in various places, and we don't just work in South Africa, but all over the world. But in South Africa, when we ask that question, people get extraordinarily defensive. And if we do a sort of evaluation of the extent of future orientation in South Africa, we would actually rate that extraordinarily low. There are various reasons for that. One of the reasons is that if you feel that you get your power from your history rather than from your future, there is almost no incentive, at least in your own mind, to talk about the future, especially when you don't have any innovative insights. So I, I, we've written in the media, media extensively that, in fact, one of the major problems in South Africa is our extraordinarily low appetite for the future. Many of us have traveled, among others, in, in Finland. And if you look, for example, at the degree of future orientedness there, you can see, to come back to Ronick's observation, the institutions themselves are future oriented. You know, Dubai has a minister of the future. In Finland, the parliament has to accept futures reports from the regions on a regular basis. It's built into the system. In our system, the power base is the past. And so when Ermsa writes this letter in April, it's dismissed some sort of neoliberal nonsense, you know, you know, and, and somehow we're, we're, we're immune to critique. We know what we're doing. Just look at our history. When we do organizational consultancy, we see exactly the same risk. If your power base comes from where you've been, you are in the most significant trouble mm. because you were subject to disruption from places that you are not suspecting. And so a degree of low future orientedness, I know it sounds like a theoretical idea, but we can see how practically that plays out in the experience that we've just right. had. Okay, I'm gonna put that then to Dr. Paddy Lehotla. And Dr. Lehotla, I would uh, agree uh, with Dr. Morster to say there's probably a low low appetite uh, for future planning and future thinking in South Africa. But the reality, sir, is that we are sitting in Johannesburg, Pretoria, Cape Town and Durban. We're not sitting in Helsinki or somewhere in uh, in Scandinavia. I would suggest, uh, Dr. Lehotler, that we simply don't have the capacity uh, to think about the future, given all the problems that we're facing in the here and now. What's your view? Well, I mean, I your naval shouldn't be your future. Unfortunately, the guys who are in parliament and government are naval gazing all the time. And they are constrained by that uh, naval gazing conduct and behavior and uh, garnering their, their support and everything in the past. Yes, the past is very important, but the future is even much more important. That's why the gaze has to be lifted. In the inland Mete scenarios, we found the key driving forces as institutional capacity and leadership that is very poor, it's mediocre uh, at all levels. There isn't any uh, resentment, uh, resilience, and issues of reconciliation are very, very crucial. And we see that those are very um, 
determinants of what we think about the future. And then social inequality is the most uh, heavy uh, part of our, our, our being. And that's what's dragging us into what we call the Guara Guara scenario. Uh, and the Guara Guara scenario has been in the making since uh, we started scenarios like the Mont Flair scenarios, uh, the future, the, the memories of the future, which the government did. And then uh, of course, uh, the, 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 the future we chose. Uh, since the future we chose within government, the idea of building scenarios was killed in 2008. So the, the government basically put its elbows in its ears and the thumbs in its retinas, not to see, not to hear anything and be immune to any information. I mean, I was invited to China and the Chinese were saying, what are the economic implications on the population of China? There were about 20 of us. I just presented the results of the census in front of a 7,000 delegates in Mangaung. I was donning my yellow suit and I blended very well with the yellow and green. And there was applause and that was the end of it. In China, there were professionals sitting, talking about what are the implications of economics of China on the population? They asked the question differently previously, 60 years back, where they asked what are the demographic implications on the economy of China in order that they look, they are forward looking. In our country, we had the National Development Plan. It's a poorly dated document, only remembered for lunch and dinner when people are going to beg for money from the treasure. We out a planning ministry. We have the BPME, ask them what they do. Department of Planning, Monitoring and Evaluation. They'll tell you that we monitor and evaluate. When it comes to planning, they'll say we coordinate. They are not having a verb called we plan. Coordination is a very superfluous and in fact, super new to the process because if the units are not organically linked in the plan because complex systems are complex they, 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 they don't have a coordinator they coordinate themselves they bring themselves together coordination is an after effect that you observe in, in systems you will say that system shows coordination you don't start by saying I'm going to coordinate if you do that you know that you are super to the process so if you are not organically linked to the system, and then you go and ask, what are the systems of planning in government? They don't exist. So, so Jeremy, I, I've been presenting numbers to government ever since I became statistician general and before. I have not seen how numb people are to numbers. We really have to up ourselves. The system of science in South Africa is governed by policing instead of innovation. If you look at the pharmaceutical and so on, people have to go and ask for permission and the like. And then the people who are supervising that, look at the vermectin and all these other things, including the, 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 the groundbreaking innovation by Emmanuel Taban, who at the, in the middle of, 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 of this crisis, Dr. Emmanuel Taban got a fiber optic, a flexible fiber optic bronchoscopy, which extracts the mucus he is the first person in the world to use that technique to address coronavirus. He is here in South Africa. He comes from the Sudan. He grew right. up here. He studied in this country. Got his pulmonology uh, qualifications. He got this. The ministerial uh, advisory committee looked at this, what he was doing, and said, uh, this is dangerous in terms of who. But Emmanuel Taban has treated successfully patient after patient. Chris Barnard, on the experiment of one, heart transplant. Right. Made Dr. Dr. Lohotla, I'm going to, again, I'm, I'm just in the interest of time and letting everyone have a fair shake at this today. I'm going to move back to Mandy Wiener. Uh, you know, Mandy, all of this makes sense. Uh, one of our participants has said, well, don't we have a plan with the, with the National Development Plan? We can get there. But my understanding was that we were always accused in this country of over planning, of over talking, of over engaging, of overthinking mm. uh, and uh, putting task teams together and commissions of inquiry. and study groups that we do all of that the reality is we don't act upon it though 
Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I think that uh, we do have a tendency to appoint panels and commissions of inquiry. And we've seen this time and time again, that if there is a crisis, government is very reactionary. Uh, we find that that's the way that, that this particular uh, administration certainly acts, is that, that they are very reactionary. They're not proactive in terms of scenario planning and looking towards the future and looking at ideas of what could happen and, and uh, playing out those scenarios. And everything does take a very, very long time. And just look at, at one example, right? You look at what happened with the Helen Joseph and Rahima Musa hospitals a couple of weeks ago with, with a water crisis. Government took time and time to evaluate and the red tape and it, it all just occupied everyone and nothing was actually done to fix the problem where you have gift of the givers coming in and and they're able to execute so quickly bypass the red tape and get things done and that's exactly what we need in this kind of, of crisis is for government to move swiftly and we saw how slow they were as I mentioned earlier about responding to this crisis uh, over the last week is they just weren't able to 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 get moving fast enough and and it's because we are so reactionary that we haven't got the the scenarios in place and the plans in place and as dr mostert mentioned about how the power is based in the past not the future so let's take another example of the national prosecuting authority authority. Here you've got a key institution for the rule of law that over the past decade has been hollowed out. We saw uh, over the years under Nomtovo Jiba and um, you know the, the various NDPP, Sean Abrahams, how the capacity of the National Prosecuting Authority was completely eviscerated. There was a mass, a mass exodus to the private sector and as a result of that we just did not have the capability to prosecute you know, complex commercial crimes or, or uh, crimes of state capture. Similarly, at the Hawks, you know, at one stage, the Hawks didn't have one forensic accountant. So it was so difficult for them to be able to, to actually, uh, you know, unravel the spaghetti, as we call it in South Africa, of these complex crimes. So as Shamila Batoy has said, when she came in as the National Director of Public Prosecutions, this is very much like fixing an airplane in flight where they need to, to react quickly, they need to prosecute the crimes, they need to reinstate that confidence in the rule of law in South Africa, but they can't do that because they've been left with a decimated system. So they don't have the capacity. So they're busy trying to fix this thing while they're in flight and, and the public is getting impatient. And, and I've also you know, written extensively about the social contract and the, and the fact that the social contract is very much uh, damaged. You know, I think that an entirely new social contract needs to, to be written. In fact, if you look at the public's reaction to the first lockdown that was announced nearly 500 days ago now, I think that there was support for the president, everybody was, you know, baking banana bread and, um, you know, we were all on board. And then there were a series of decisions that were very questionable from government around Woolies chicken and hot pies and capri pants and smoking cigarettes that, you know, were just unfathomable. There was jackbooted behavior by soldiers and the incident of Collins Causa. There were a number of court cases that that uh, that were carried out uh, to challenge government's um, regulations, and I think all of this has compounded. And then, when the president a couple of weeks ago stood up again and announced a, a fresh lockdown, the reaction was completely. Uh, difference to that first lockdown. And that just demonstrates for me how the social contract has been damaged over the past year and a half, particularly. And, and that's why there was so much frustration, I think, with the way that government has behaved um, and the way that government has responded. And, and it's because Ramaphosa does have this very consultative approach to leadership. He does like to appoint you know, various people to think about things. And I, I think that there has to be a reshuffle. I think that's, that it, it, it has to be imminent. Otherwise, it really is going to undermine his leadership and his executive at this point, because we have seen the security clusters completely failed him. And the longer that he keeps them in place, I think that the more they're going to continue to, to undermine his authority. You're on mute, Jeremy. Mute myself. Thank you, Mandy. The question, of course, is will he have the courage to actually do that? Um, Rana Kapaldas, I want to put participants today, and it leads 
nicely from a point that Dr. Lehotla made a little earlier about the country taking its eye off the policy ball. Uh, Zaid says South Africa is well known for leading policy designed the world over. I think we all concur on that. But we've always experienced uh, poor implementation. He wants to know what is missing in that service delivery value chain. In other words, I guess, uh, to move it from the glacier-like speed that Mandy Wiener referred to, to something a little bit more practical and implementable and something that could perhaps act as a bulwark uh, to what we've seen uh, occurring right now. I think the long and the short of that answer is political will. Uh, quite frankly, we don't have the skills at multiple levels of, of government. Uh, we don't have the technical capacity. And we're in an era where you've effectively, you've got this paradox of the state where the role, the influence, the reach of the state post COVID uh, is now expanding. And we've seen that the world over. Yet uh, the, the, the state is a, is, a, is a key inhibitor of our progress in, in a lot of factors. So there's no getting around the way, uh, the fact that that the state is both the problem and part of the solution. Uh, and again, speaking to the point around social contracts, I think how the state engages its citizens, its international creditors, international powers, non-state actors, uh, and the business community is going to be instrumental in determining that. Um, I think, you know, touching on, on something else uh, in, in relation to the issue of risk, I think, you know, there's, there's been a lot of question marks around how this affects South Africa's risk profile. And I think it's quite clear that there's gonna be a, a risk premium demanded on South African assets. We haven't quite seen that in financial markets to a great extent because of global conditions which are supportive. But I think you know, the, the, the questions are gonna hinge around whether there's going to be contagion around this, whether it's going to be just a short-term problem or something more longer term, whether we're entering into this winter of discontent. And I think you know, what it's done is really shattered the myth of South African exceptionalism um, in and around the African continent. Uh, as it is, we were struggling with policy inertia, e economic reform was really still born. Um, and I think if you're an FDI investor who's putting bricks and mortar and boots on the ground, you're going to think twice uh, if this is going to become a longer term problem. I think the, the one other aspect where I think people have blind spots is in looking at the regional implications. Um, you know, uh, I think what I've been working on at the moment is this question around a Southern African spring, given the protests in Eswatini, given the situation in Mozambique, Zimbabwe's repressive regime, uh, Zambia going to the polls in default uh, and with democratic regression. I think those are probably off the mark, largely because these countries are small, they have different political structures, but I think there is the propensity for a longer term winter of discontent because there are common features in all of these countries uh, which, which, which stymie progress. Um, weak and ineffective governance with a huge distrust of the state, uh, susceptibility to, to climatic conditions and uh, very clearly a lack of economic competitiveness. So, you know, I think we, we need to also bear in mind that with a distracted South Africa, one that is dysfunctional and dealing with its own domestic issues, if South Africa fails, the rest of the region is in big, big trouble. So, um, you know, for, for those who do have businesses across the region, that is something to consider. I think the, the response function needs to be one where business and the private sector does step up. And ultimately, we've got to address these issues of socioeconomic inequality, of poverty, and rebuild and repair that social contract. And Dr. Mona Mustard, it comes down to understanding the environment. And Yvonne Motibi, um, one of our panelists, asks this important question. How could key state institutions have averted this insurrection by, she says, making use of intelligent data analytics. Dr. Lahotla will get to you on this question as well. She goes on to ask, what were the key risk indicators that should have drawn government's urgent attention leading to this crisis? So let's take it down from theory into the practical. What should government have been looking out for? Yeah, great question. So, so for us, the, the it all it always our curiosity always starts with the mindset. What's going on in, in what dominates your thinking, which makes you accentuate certain elements in the society and make you uh, develop blind spots in others. So when you when you look at that mindset, I've already indicated a kind of a past orientation rather than a future orientation. And in fact, data analytics would be an example of 
a, a present orientation, in other words, just paying attention, and a future orientation, in other words, some kind of anticipatory competence or at least just a will to explore this. But I know it sounds theoretical. Let me make this practical for you, Jeremy. The, the, one of the reasons people don't ask questions about the future is because the first reaction is about a question on the present. So, for example, if you were to ask, what is your goal to have people read and write in a, a paragraph of English or any other language at the age of 11? What's your goal? And if the answer to that is, let's say, 60 percent, well, then the first question is, well, where are you now? And that's so embarrassing that you'd rather not ask the question about the future. So you just ride the wave of the past as far as you can. So that's the first thing, a future orientation rather than a past orientation. I've made that point, I've given you an example. The second thing though, um, is I really loved Rainek's observation about South African exceptionalism. This idea that South Africa is a special little country with special little rules. In the short term, that gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling that we're all part of something special. But in the long term, what happens is it, it means that you start to defend deeply dysfunctional behavior. Zuma does what he does with impunity because, hey, South Africa is a special case, a different situation. And so with COVID, one of the things that's happened is an, or, an international orientation. It was one of those, if, if one may dare to say something positive about COVID, there were two positive signs. One, an international orientation that this is not the cause of some sort of faction against you. This is an international idea. And the second one was a scientific orientation, which South Africa also severely lacks. And that is closely related to a lack of innovation, which Dr. Lotlo also referred to. So a, a future orientation, an international orientation, and a scientific orientation. What have we had? A past orientation, an exceptionalist orientation and an ideological orientation, the exact opposite of what we need. And because of that mindset, you just can't see the warning signs. Dr. Lahotla and the rest of the panelists, as we approach uh, the quarter past the hour, I want to start bringing this conversation uh, into the risk community itself. And I'll start with you, Dr. Lahotla. What do organizations now need to do? And when I say organizations, both the private and the public sector, what do they need to do in the here and now, immediately, today, uh, in order to relook at their risk planning? What needs to be changed, in your opinion? What needs to be prioritized? Well, I mean, uh, you know, I'm in the field of statistics and uh, the, the beauty of statistics uh, gives you a perfect side of your uncertainty, that uh, you have to understand that it is uncertain, but it is manageable. That's uh, the important thing. And I want to talk about uh, Cyrus the Great, who talked about uh, diversity in council, unity in command. And those two principles of uncertainty and diversity in council and unity in command bring it together to what focus should be about. We must ask questions because by asking questions, you actually reveal your blind spots. In an environment where we are imbibed or at least we imbibe the pipe of a good story to tell, that kind of approach, which the government has always for the last number of years adopted to hanker after a good story to tell, it's, a, it's very, very problematic without looking at the data and the science of the data. I mean, uh, the president and uh, the state of the nation address was quick to look at the crime survey, uh, jobs have come back, ignoring the statistician general surveys, which a week later came with the numbers, which showed mm. that there were no jobs cut. So who advises the president? I remember. Mm. So it's very, very important to take these numbers seriously especially time series, because time series is the asset of statistics. Now, Maybe added to we, that asset, uh, then, then added to that asset, it's your data analytics and so on, but it's very, very important to look at a time series and establish that. That's what 
we have to be, uh, we should embrace, but we also have to up our act and in leadership. And uh, those are the, the most important things uh, that we have to do. And then create, get the tools of planning. They are absent in government. And uh, people avoid them all the time. They say, uh, we are in a crisis, we don't have time to plan. That's the time when you actually put shoulder to heel to plan. You cannot, in a crisis, fail to plan. That means the crisis will eat you up. Maddie, back to you. What what key questions then? If if Dr. Lahotla is is suggesting that we we need to be more interrogative, that we need mm. to be asking tougher questions, that we're not buying the line and the spin. Um, again, bring it back to people who are planning for the future. Those people in organisations that are risk professionals. What key questions do you think they should be asking of government? Put your journalist hat on. Uh, well, so firstly, um, on a very practical level, wouldn't it be great if the president actually took questions from journalists, Jeremy? I mean, we've been going on about this for ages now. The president has these family meetings, and I, I hate that term, um, I where, that, he, yeah. where he addresses the nation. But as journalists, we've been begging and pleading for a Q&A session with the president. And he he will not hold a Q&A session with the journalists at this point. And I don't know if it's because he, he doesn't want to look like he doesn't know the answers. It's because he doesn't want to be questioned. And I think that will go a long way in, in repairing that relationship with the public and, and with the media as well. I think that he absolutely has to take questions. Um, you know, so that's the one aspect. I do want to just uh, bring this down to a practical level as well um, uh, around what the government could have done uh, and should have done. And I think it comes down to, to very fundamentals in terms of, of law enforcement and intelligence structures. So I think that on a very practical level, they did not have operatives in place where they needed to be actually monitoring who they needed to monitor. And it's not like the whole country couldn't see the various tea parties taking place at Mukanda and this buildup of tension. They literally told us what was coming. Carl Niehaus literally stood up and said, there is going to be an insurrection if, uh, if Jacob Zuma goes to prison. So the fact that they were so unprepared is astonishing. The fact that um, a younger Bloodlaw can say, uh, or can say, oh, but we just thought that private security companies would protect shopping centers. So we didn't do that is astonishing. And I think that what we've learned from this and what organizations can learn from this is the fact that you're on your own. And if there is this reliance on, on the government to protect you, I think we've seen over the last couple of weeks that that is not the case, that we cannot have confidence in the security structure, in law enforcement, in our intelligence networks. It's just not there. For such a long time, the intelligence networks from crime intelligence to the state security agency has been so consumed with spying on one another and factionalism that they haven't been doing the work that we actually need them to do. So at the moment, crime intelligence in the police is headed by an acting person. We had Peter Jacobs coming in um, and he was removed recently and he was starting to steady the ship and they were starting to do the right work. I've been speaking to people in police crime intelligence and, and it's just scary, the fact that they didn't know what was going on that they, they weren't the right operatives in place. And this is on a very practical level, right? That they weren't necessarily monitoring the phones of people. All of this um, was happening over, over WhatsApp and social media, and they just weren't the, the proper measures in place to, to deal with this. And I think that's really concerning. And I think if you are going to be looking at organizational risk and in, in the context of South Africa over the, you know, the future, I think you need to be able to be self-sufficient and be able to, to deal with the crisis on, on your own. Um, and I think that's what we've seen. We've seen corporations over the last week having to kick into gear, get medication and essentials down to staff in, in KZN because they simply can't rely on government to restore the, that supply chain. Um, and I think that, you know, that's been the, the, the message. And then what I would like to see happen is, you know, I think that one of the big concerns from the president now, I mentioned a reshuffle earlier, but we need to see people who are experts in their fields taking over. So, um, you know, if, if you are going to have a, um, uh, a minister of telecommunications, don't have Stella and Benny Abrahams, have somebody who actually knows what they're talking about in that particular field. Um, you know, if you're going to have a health minister, it was great to have William Kieser because he is a medical doctor. But this idea of cadre deployment is just so 
uh, dysfunctional. It just doesn't work. And I think the ANC needs to reform itself. That's, it needs to, to find a new way to, to allocate power and cronyism. Um, otherwise, this is going to continue to happen. Ronak Gopaldas, I don't take a lot of solace from what Mandy Wiener has just said. Um, she talks about a lack of confidence. Um, she talks about uh, organizations having to look after themselves. She speaks about uh, the private sector in many instances filling the vacuum. Um, is there a sense now when it comes to planning that essentially South Africans' organizations are on their own, that we've got to look after our own best interests because simply we have no net in place? I don't think that's sustainable, personally. Uh, I don't think uh, businesses can operate on the fringes or on the margins of society. I think we've got to fix the actual problem instead of skirting yeah. around it. So that requires a technically competent, caring, responsive state at the core, and it requires a, a business sector that, that is, is uh, about inclusive capitalism and one that is able to understand that they need to maximize societal value, not only shareholder value. So I think that's pretty fundamental and public private partnerships are essential. I think what we've seen through crisis is that we have this ability to come together and to be resilient. Uh, and you know that initial spark and that collaboration that we've, we've seen one through the initial first lockdown where we've seen the, the SPY initiatives and COBRA and all of these kind of things, mm. but the private sector and the public sector can work together, but we need a new template and a new way of working together because otherwise it's not, it's not going to be sustainable. I think, you know, from, from a government perspective, I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit on the table and confidence is the cheapest stimulus. We need to stop scoring on goals. Um, and, and a big part of that, and to, to echo Mandy's point, is around communication. We cannot consistently, no investor worth their salt is going to invest in a country where you're saying one thing on Monday and saying an entirely different thing on Tuesday. So I think getting going back to basics and getting those, those things right are, are, are essentials. I think, you know, I, I would say there is some scope for optimism, right? So institutional reform is happening, although albeit slowly, politically, directionally, I don't think this changes much within the ANC. I think there's no great hankering for the return of Jacob Zuma. I don't think the radical economic transformation faction is going to take control of the ANC. So there are, there's obviously policy inertia that is a, a consequence of this, but I, I think there are, there are some signs of a directional move moves in a positive way. But of course, uh, the fundamental problems are around creating jobs um, and creating inclusive growth. And um, so I think, you know, the, 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 the question for risk professionals is not only how do you analyze and understand risks, it's how do you mitigate risks. Uh, we need to remember also not, not too long ago in London in 2011, there were, there were riots and looting to the same, to the same extent. So um, just a bit of perspective is also warranted, um, and we shouldn't navel gaze too much. We've got four minutes left in this conversation, and I'm going to come to each of you for some closing remarks. And I'll preface it by asking you this question, and uh, you can either answer it or go off on your own tangent. I don't mind. Which one? But something in the the immediate short term is going to look like and when I talk about the immediate short term I'm Jeremy just to check your yeah. your last little bit did not come through to the panel so Jeremy's glitching and I said I would jump in if it happened so so maybe Dr. Mostert if you wanted to start and and we'll follow the same uh route that we went earlier, if you want to wrap up then. Thanks so much, um, Mandy and Jeremy. For us, the future is never inevitable. And more than one future is always possible. So we have choices to make. And those choices will have a dramatic impact on our future. We cannot fine tune the current model to the point where it gives us the future we want. In other words, innovation is not optional. It is no longer a luxury. The current model, however optimized, will never give us the desired future. And therefore, 
if we want to be radical, if that's something that people in the ANC need to be to feel a sense of existential worth, then radical innovation is not the worst place to start. We need, I'll conclude um, and, and reiterate, a mindset that is future oriented. So let's hear about the South Africa we want rather than the South Africa we don't want. Can the president stop talking about what we cannot have and start talking about what we should have? Secondly, a society much more respectful and interested in science rather than ideology and a society much more conscious of the potential of its international relations from which is the only possible place we can get FDI. The key to FDI is in the F. Innovation is no longer optional. Dr. Mostert, thank you very much indeed. And Mandy, thanks for stepping in there. I believe I had a, a break in my transmission. Dr. Paddy Lahotla, I hope that you're hearing me. Um, just some yes, closing remarks from you, sir. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Somalia had hope and he still has hope. And we may be like Somalia because we are not very exceptional if we don't take heed. We need certain and uh, uh, in the Indula Meti scenarios, we have put three options, three scenarios. The Guarawara scenario, which we are in, which will take us to Somalia. If we don't radically lift our gaze, the, Naila, uh, the Isi Bujwa scenario, which is things waking trickle down effect, or the Naila Walk scenario, which is possible, and we have modeled it, and we have illustrated how that could be possible. There is no silver bullet. We need to bring all things together. And social compacting is now the overturn window of political possibilities where the impossible become the inevitable. We are at that point where that impossibility is an inevitability so that we can shift and make South Africa work. Mm -hmm. It is possible to get out of this moral. That, that, but those fundamental that is a, have to be and That is a crucial, a crucial uh, nexus point. Mandy Wiener, very quickly, um, as we are on... So very quickly, um, I think that we... Uh, some quick closing remarks from you, then uh, Ronak to you, then I'll hand over to Christopher. So, so very quickly, I think that, but firstly, we need to know what actually happened. So I think there needs to be transparency from governments about who's actually behind this. They need to come clean with us. We need to know names. We need to know all of that, what went wrong. They need to review the way that, that uh, intelligence dealt with us. I think that's the one. And then it has to be a catalyst for the ANC and for, for government, um, for the ANC in the sense that they need to, to relook at, um, at, at uh, their factionalism and how they're dealing with it. They need to make some, some clear choices. I think that Ramaphosa needs to use this as a catalyst to, um, to uh, you know, his grip on power um, and who he surrounds himself with. I'd like to see a cabinet reshuffle. And then I think that there is space for optimism as well. I think as, as civil society, we always see civil society in South Africa stepping into the breach. And I think the way that South Africans responded um, is very encouraging. And I think that, that, that that for me does give me optimism for the future. The fact that uh, we were able to, to you know, stem this from, from getting any worse. So, so I am actually optimistic, even though I've, I've been so critical about government's response to it. That is good to hear. Rona Kogopaldas, I'll give you the final word, then Christopher Palm stand by. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, so I think, you know, in this context, we, I've, met, I've spoken about the conditions which are fertile for conflict and for disruption, uh, young people clamoring for change and, and unhappy with the status quo. And if we continue on the current path, what you're going to have is the rich creating a parallel private state, you're going to have the poor vulnerable to organized crime, and then you're going to have something in the middle, which uh, is, is a big question mark around. I think the good news is that the future is in our hands. We do have agency and we can make decisions to change this. Um, I think though we require a fundamentally different type and style of leadership, as Monet said, one that's future oriented. And I think just playing with a couple of scenarios looking ahead, we could very conceivably end up the way that India did, uh, where an economic crisis pre precipitates coalition governments, where the politics potentially goes left and the economics go right because we end up in an IMF program. And how that circle is squared, 
uh, I think is something that is that is interesting and something that will require a different type of consensus building going forward. So I think there, there is scope uh, for optimism, as Mandy said, um, but there are a lot of moving parts. As Mandy has just put on the uh, on the chat box, uh, never waste a good crisis. Um, ladies and gentlemen, to all of you who've participated or have watched us today, thank you very much indeed. Uh, to Morne, to Paddy, to Mandy, and to Ronak, thank you very much indeed. Apologies from some of the technical uh, glitches on my side. It is what it is. Um, Christopher Palm, I'll hand over to you to um, make some closing remarks. To the panelists, thank you for the wisdom them the insight and a stimulating conversation. Excellent. Thank you, Jeremy. And thank you to you for, again, facilitating such a strong panel and giving us the insights that we need as the risk profession. You know, um, listening to, to the conversations, looking at the risk chats, looking at the Q&A, I think if I, if I have to, uh, given time, if I have to just leave the risk profession with one thought, I think it is the question about how do we move the conversation from looking at the past to focusing on the future? I think that is the question. Not that I've told you so, but answering why did you not listen? And I think that's the, the introspection that we have to do as a risk profession. And of course, just to say very quickly, we will be reducing this morning's um, discussions into a summary document that we will circulate, but of course the recording will also be available. And again to the panel, thank you so much. Mandy, thank you for jumping in when we had the technical issues. Marvelous, Monet, Dr. Monet Mostak, nice seeing you again. Ronak, the pleasure was all mine meeting you. Dr. Pali, I am terribly uh, disappointed that I could never see, I've never seen you in your yellow suit. So <laughs> I'm of course going to Google that <laughs> afterwards. And Jeremy, again, thank you so much for your contribution this morning. Roxanne, Quibus, Valerie, the comms and marketing team, thank you so much. And then of course to Marsh, such short notice getting this panel together. Thank you very much for your support and thanks for stepping up. And with that then, I'll leave you with asking you to please fill in our performance questionnaire. We're looking forward to your recommendations, how we can improve this going forward. Um, and that just leaves me to say thank you to everybody for participating. It was a fabulous session. And this is so powerful for us to be able to set our context to understand the future moving forward. Thank you so much and have a lovely day further. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank, thank you, you very much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Yeah. Peace.